This deep dive is going to be a wild ride. Get ready to rethink what we call reality. We're diving into the case against reality. Yeah, it's a real head scratcher. It sure is this book by Donald Hoffman. He's a cognitive scientist, right? He is, yeah. And he basically says everything we experience, like, uh, you know, colors, sounds, even space and time, might be totally off. Like, we're not seeing the real deal. Not seeing the real deal, huh? So w what are we seeing then? He says it's more like a uh, like a user interface. You know, something evolution has kind of tweaked and refined. User interface. So instead of the raw code of the universe, we get simplified icons on our desktop. Makes you wonder why, though. What's the evolutionary advantage of, like, hiding reality from us? Right, and that's where this whole fitness payoff thing comes in. Basically, anything that helps an organism survive, reproduce, pass on its genes, that's a fitness payoff. Hoffman's saying our senses evolved to show us what helps us survive, not necessarily the truth. So we're seeing the like survival edition of reality, not the director's cut. Just enough to help us find food, mates, dodge danger, that kind of thing. Yeah, basically. Yeah. And the thing is, he actually backs this up with, get this, the fitness beats truth theorem. Mm -hmm. It's like uh, using evolutionary game theory to prove that organisms that focus on these survival signals, these fitness payoffs, they actually do better than those who see reality, quote unquote, as it is. So it's like those poor male jewel beetles, right? Mm -hmm. The ones that try to mate with beer bottles. Exactly. They're wired to go for shiny, dimpled brown, mm. which out in nature usually means a female beetle. But beer bottles just happen to tick those boxes, too. And, yeah. well, you know the rest. Evolutionary. <laughs> but seriously, it just shows how our idea of beauty, even though it feels so real and instinctual, might just be pointing us toward these uh, fitness payoffs, not actual beauty. Exactly. It makes you wonder what other beer bottles we're falling for in our lives, you know. Mm. But this idea that our perception is a tool that has way bigger implications. Doesn't Hoffman even question our understanding of space-time? Like, maybe we've got that wrong, too. He does. He says, yeah, our experience of space-time, you know, this 3D world we're in, might not be the fundamental reality at all. Whoa, hold on. He's not saying, like, the universe is ending or anything. No, no, no. He means our perception of it, how we experience space and time. That could be an illusion. An illusion. Okay, now that's a bold statement. What makes him think that? Well, this is where it gets really cool. Because this idea actually kind of lines up with some pretty mind-blowing stuff happening in physics right now. Like, uh, you familiar with the holographic principle at all? Okay, now you're just messing with me. Holographic principle. Sounds like something straight out of Star Trek. Right. So, picture this. The holographic principle says that all the info about a 3D region of space, everything in it, could actually be encoded on a 2D surface around it. Like imagine, like a hologram, right? Uh. Looks 3D, but the info's all on a flat surface. So our reality, this whole 3D thing, it could be like a projection from some kind of lower dimension we can't even see. That's what Hoffman's getting at. Think of it this way. That crazy, realistic video game world. All those dimensions. It all comes from a flat disk, right? Okay, now my brain's officially starting to hurt. Mm. And it's not just space and time either. He also says color, like what we see, it's totally limited. Totally. Our whole rainbow, just a tiny sliver of the electromagnetic spectrum. There are wavelengths out there we can't even fathom. So we're basically only hearing like three notes on a piano when there's a whole symphony going on. Exactly. And here's the thing. Other organisms, they're tuned in differently. Hoffman talks about this plant, Arabidopsis thaliana. It's got way more photoreceptors than us, sees a way richer spectrum. Wow, makes you wonder what we're missing out on. So our senses are filtering things out big time. But it's more than just filtering, right? Doesn't he say our brains actually mess with how we see color? Yeah, it's not passive. He's got this whole thing about chromatures, which is color and texture combined. It says those are key to triggering our emotions, behaviors, not just the color itself, but what it's attached to. So like a green chromature on broccoli, maybe that makes it look tasty. But the same green, different texture, could be totally unappetizing. Right. Green apple versus green, uh, I don't know, mold. Same color, totally different vibe. Our brains are making those connections constantly, shaping how we experience things. It's kind of freaky when you realize how much of what we call reality is just our brains making stuff up. Right. It's like we're getting the highlight reel, not the raw footage. And evolutionarily, it makes sense. Our brains want to focus on what'll keep us alive. We're primed to notice certain cues. Didn't he have a term for that? He calls them exogenous cues. Things out in the environment that grab our attention. Stuff we're wired to notice. Exogenous cues. Got it. 
But what about the stuff we're like actively looking for based on what we need? Right. So those would be your endogenous goals driven by what's going on inside. Like, are you hungry, tired, whatever? If you're starving, you're going to notice that burger ad way more than if you just ate. <laughs> Friends like, hey, look, food. Remember that goal you had? Makes sense. But how does this whole exogenous, endogenous thing play out in real life? You mentioned marketing earlier. So I'm walking down the street starving, right? And my brain's like, ooh, shiny golden arches. Pay attention. Because that lines up with my uh, my need for food, my goal. But how do marketers actually use this stuff? Like, they're not just randomly putting up flashing lights, are they? Well, they are, kind of. But there's a method to the madness. It's all about tapping into that uh that wiring we have, those mm -hmm. preferences we've evolved to have. So those flashing neon signs, those are messing with our, what was it, our exogenous something. Exogenous cues, yeah. Those signs, they're designed to be impossible to ignore, even if you're not consciously looking for them. Yeah. They hijack your attention. Sneaky. It's like our brains are just wired to notice certain things and bam, marketing wins. Basically. And it's not just, you know, flashing lights, bright colors, big sons, attractive faces, Anything that signals potential reward, something our brains are naturally drawn to. Remember those, uh, what were they called? Supernormal stimuli? Oh, yeah, right. The, like the exaggerated versions of things, like yeah. that candy bar that's engineered to be ridiculously sweet and fatty. Exactly. Marketing's gotten really good at creating those products and ads that hit those buttons in our brains. By understanding how we evolve to pay attention, they can make some seriously effective campaigns. It's kind of scary when you think about it, how much our senses can be like manipulated. But hey, knowledge is power, right? Maybe now we can be more aware of it. Yeah, for sure. By understanding the uh, the evolutionary reasons behind our perceptions, we can start to see through some of those tricks, those carefully designed interfaces. So next time I'm on social media, seeing those perfect influencer posts, I should remember that's not reality. That's just like a carefully crafted message targeting my deepest desires and insecurities. Exactly. There's a whole lot going on behind that image, a lot of psychology and algorithms at play. Wow, it's a lot to process, but this whole deep dive has been really eye-opening. So if we had to pick one big takeaway from Hoffman's book, what would you say it is? Hmm, that's tough. I think it's gotta be like, don't just assume what you see is reality, question it. Just because something feels real doesn't mean it's an objective truth. Our senses are a product of evolution, that's right? Shy. They're made to help us survive not necessarily show us the whole picture. So healthy dose of skepticism is always a good thing. Always. But, you know, don't forget the wonder and curiosity, too. What Hoffman's saying is there might be so much more to reality than we can even grasp, which is pretty exciting. It really is. So to everyone listening, if you want to have your mind blown wide open, definitely check out The Case Against Reality. It'll make you think about perception, consciousness, the whole shebang, and a whole new light. And hey, maybe you'll even start to wonder if our senses are so species-specific, what does the world look like to a bird, to a dolphin, to another human even? Now those are questions to ponder. And on that note, we'll leave you all to contemplate the nature of your own reality. Until next time, keep questioning, keep exploring, and keep diving deep.